I'd like to welcome everybody to Zoom with ZOA, a very special edition coming to you live from Israel. We're going to be doing a tour of the Binyamin region, and we'll, uh, we'll get started in just a few moments. My uh, colleague and co-host in Israel, Dan Uluz, uh, is ZOA's new representative in Israel. Dan is originally from Montreal, Canada. He moved to Israel after finishing his legal studies at McGill University and specializing in international law. Dan serves in an, as an international law advisor to the uh, reserve duty. Uh, Dan worked in international law department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Israel as a legislative advisor to the Likud in the Knesset, as well as in senior management positions in Israel's third sector. We will be um, doing a live tour of Binyamin. Uh, please use the chat section to post your questions. We will try to get to some Q&A at the end of the tour. In advance, I'm going to let everybody know that we're going to go a little bit over an hour today. We need that much time to do a proper tour. And with that, Dan, I'd like to turn the program over to you. Have a great program. We'll see you at the tail end. Thank you very much, Alan, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, so as Alan mentioned, my name is Daniel Luz, and I'm the representative of ZOA here in Israel. And my job is basically to connect between Israel and the amazing work that ZOA does in America. And at a time when there are too many post-Zionist voices coming out of the Jewish community in America, my job is to make sure that Israelis know that there's a strong Zionist, unapologetic voice led by the ZOA in America. And this is important because the fear of a rift between the diaspora Jewry and Israel uh, often informs Israeli policymakers when they're making decisions. And ZOA's strong Zionist voice can give Israelis the confidence they need in order to make the right decisions. And that's basically what my job is. Uh, in the past few weeks, uh, ZOA has been running several webinars that have been very successful with guests both from Israel and North America. Uh, these webinars give us an opportunity to hear from brilliant minds uh, and to better understand the challenges facing Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, before we get into today's webinar, uh, I just want to announce some of the next events that are planned uh, for the next few days. So the first one will be on Tuesday, August 4th uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, this is an event uh, with a discussion between Elon Carr uh, and Morton Klein. Elon Carr is the U.S. Department Special Envoy uh, envoys, sorry, uh, for monitoring and com combating anti-Semitism. And Morton Klein is, uh, of course, is ZOA's national president. They'll be having a discussion about anti-Israel and anti-Zionism. Are these the accepted forms of Jew hatred? Uh, and the discussion will be moderated by Steve Feldman, the Greater Philadelphia ZOA Executive Director. The next event will be uh, an, an event uh, as part of the ZOA Book Club. A, me a book club meeting. It will happen on Wednesday, August 5th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it will be an event with Ambassador Danny Danon, uh, who will present his book called Israel, The Will to Prevail. And it will be an event moderated by Liz Burney, the Director of Special Projects uh, at ZOA. Again, Wednesday at 1 p.m. All of the information is on our website, uh, and you can see also the information in the chat. So, before we get to the uh, actual uh, tour, uh, today's program has been organized in cooperation with the Binyamin Regional Council. Uh, and so it's really with great pleasure that I want to introduce the director of the international desk of the Binyamin Regional uh, Council that's here with us today, Miri Maoz Ovadia. Miri is 32 years old, married with three children and lives uh, in the community Nevetsu, which is uh, in the west of the Binyamin region. She's the director of the International Desk, as I said, and has also been a spokesperson for the Yesha Council uh, since 2012. She has hosted hundreds of international delegations throughout the region and has been responsible for various projects focused on advocating for the Judea, Samaria, and Binyamin communities. Uh, Miri, I uh, 
your turn. So, shalom. Hi, everybody. I want to say thank you to Dan, whom I've been in touch with, and for all the people in ZOA who have um, been helpful in helping this event uh, come into life. Um, it's really what we've realized that although times of crisis like the world is going through today, uh, technology has come up with ways to bring us closer and to give us the ability to meet with each other and to host you uh, in one of the most special places that we have here. I want to quickly introduce uh, the Benjamin Regional Council and then I'll try and give maximum time for Eliana to, uh, to take us around the special place of ancient Chilo. So the Benjamin Regional Council is the largest regional council in Israel. It's located straight in the center, about half an hour drive from the International Airport, half an hour from Jerusalem and from Tel Aviv. Today we have 49 communities in our area. I'm sure some of them are familiar to you, uh, like Ofra, Shilo, Eli, maybe even Evetsuf, where I live. Um, one of the things that we feel very lucky uh, about are that uh, some of the most important places uh, for the Jewish people, the important pillars of Jewish history, uh, happened here in this area. Um, stories from the Tanakh, the foundations that made our people who they are today. And uh, and times that are not grown at times. We have so many visitors from around the world and from Israel as well who come to Tor Binyamin from east to west to visit ancient Chilo, to drink the boutique wine over here, to meet with people. And uh, amazing connections are formed between the Jews living in Israel and Jews living in the diaspora. I want to uh, take um, this opportunity to wish you all well and healthy. Um, we've been looking into the situation around the world. We hosted a very special prayer here in Chilo on Rosh Chodesh Sivan hoping that the Jewish communities around the U.S. specifically are, will, will do better and hopefully manage to overcome this crisis. Uh, today in Benjamin, it's one of the fastest growing uh, communities here in Israel. We have a lot of young couples that are moving into our communities. Uh, we are also very lucky to have um, Aliyah, young uh, Olim from various countries around the world coming to live here as well. And we hope that when uh, the skies open and the uh, corona crisis is a bit calmed down, We'll be able to host you here face to face and take you around in this beautiful region. So thank you for this opportunity to meet through Zoom. And I want to introduce our amazing uh, guide and my good friend, Eliana Passantine. Eliana, are you with us? Um, Eliana is an amazing educator and tour guide. We've been working together for many years. She's been taking hundreds of uh, groups around and uh, Judea and Samaria and Chilo, and the most beautiful who looks Chilo and is deeply connected to this special place and to the story of Chilo. She's a mother of eight children. May they all be uh, healthy. And uh, today she'll be taking around, us around uh, in uh, this virtual platform around ancient Chilo. And um, so Eliana, thank you very much in advance. Thank uh, you for we'll be happy if you can leave remarks and questions on the chat box. Save questions to the end of the session. That's okay. So if everybody's ready, let's start. Okay, Mary, one of the first questions here was a map of Binyamin. So while I give the introduction, if you could maybe get a map ready for us of the Binyamin region, that would be wonderful. Sure, sure. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm so happy to be with you here today. My name is Eliana. I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. I came on Aliyah with my parents to Herzliya Pituach when I was 11 years old. And my husband and I, David, made another aliyah up to the mountains of Binyamin 25 years ago. We live in a town called Eli, named for Eli HaKohen, Eli the high priest, who was the last high priest to serve in the Mishkan and the tabernacle in Shiloh. Our home overlooks ancient Shiloh, and we're about to embark on a journey through time. We're going back 3,500 years in time to the time that Shiloh was Israel's first capital. Uh, the tour is going to be for about 45 minutes, and then I'm going to have as much time as you'd like for questions. So I'm not going to be reading the questions as we go along on the tour. I'm going to wait uh, towards the end, and I'll be happy to take your questions. So let's start with our tour. Oh, okay. Can everyone see Shiloh? So this is a bird's eye view of ancient Shiloh. Ancient Shiloh is a national heritage site. It is an archeological park. And this is the ancient tell of Shiloh. And this is part of the agriculture you can see on the, on the right hand side of modern Shiloh. But I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, so this is the entrance to ancient Shiloh. When you come to Israel next, I'll be happy to meet you right here. And I'm just gonna take you on a virtual tour 
and we're going to walk through as if we were walking into Shiloh today. Now, this is what ancient Shiloh looks like. And what's incredible and interesting is, can you see this is set up for a wedding? Now, because in Israel, you can only have 30 people at a wedding now. We've, we've been hosting Corona weddings here. Um, and so you can have 30 people seated over here and then another 30 outside. So everybody's coming to get married at Shiloh because it's an archeological park. Whoops, sorry. Because it's an archeological park, and it's not a wedding hall, we can get some more people in. This is our gift shop. It's one of the most unique gift shops in Israel. Everything is local. And this is the entrance. This is the other part of our new wedding hall. Um, there's a picnic area and on Cholamoid, Pesach and Sukkot, we have a crafts fair and uh, all biblical crafts. We have thousands of people visiting and because it's so spread out, you don't feel the people coming. I don't know what's gonna happen with this Sukkot, but there's a, a beautiful crafts fair. We're gonna go to our first stop and begin the tour. So standing here in Shiloh, we're standing outside this basilica, but I'll tell you how we even know this is Shiloh and where it all begins. So for 40 years, the children of Israel are wandering through the desert with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses is taking them through the desert and they are carrying the Mishkan, carrying the tabernacle. Now we see over here, this is a model of the Mishkan right over here. When you come to Shiloh today, you will be able to see an unbelievable hologram of the Mishkan. Um, so here we have the tabernacle. They're carrying this through the desert. This is a model of the tabernacle in the desert. And after 40 years in the desert, Joshua bin Nun, Yoshua bin Nun crosses the Jordan, brings the children of Israel into Israel, and they place the tabernacle in Gilgal. Seven years of conquering, seven years of settling. And then Hashem tells Yoshua to come to Shiloh and establish Israel's first capital city and what I like to call Israel's first state. For 369 years, this is the first capital of Israel before Jerusalem. 369 years, just to get a grasp um, what that means. The first temple in Jerusalem stood for 410 years, and the second temple in Jerusalem stood for 420. In comparison, for almost 400 years, the Mishkan, the first tab the tabernacle, which is almost like the first Beit HaMikdash, like the first temple, stood here in Shiloh. When archaeologists come to a site like this, they have a dream to find three things. They would like to find some kind of archaeological find and inscription. Doesn't have to say Hannah was here, but something that proves that this is Shiloh. They want to find a pasuk, uh, some kind of reference in the Tanakh. And they'd also like to find the uh, preservation of the ancient Hebrew name. Now this building that we see here today, when the archaeologists come for the first time to Shiloh in 1922, the archaeologists are from Denmark. They're Christians, they're holding their Tanakh, and they are looking for Shiloh, they're looking for Hana, they're looking for the Mishkan, and they uncover six churches from the Byzantine period. Now, the church we were just walking through, as you see, the bottom, everything on the bottom is original, the mosaic floor, the pillars, but the top was reconstructed in 1924 because when the archaeologists came to Shiloh, they wanted a place to camp out, and they realized that this is a basilica and they built the reconstruction. Today it's used as uh, a culture home. We have a boutique concerts here with a wine bar and it's really uh, beautiful to come. We are going to leave the basilica now and go out to our next stop. What's nice about this virtual tour, it's a really hot day here today, so we don't have to schlep all the way up the mountain. I would like to stop here for a second. When I said the archeologists come and they uncover a number of finds, so you have lots of different archeologists who have different ideas. Where could the Mishkan be? Everybody's looking for the Mishkan. Everybody's looking for the place of the tabernacle. So let's start with, we're looking for a big, a large place, but some archeologists, when they started uncovering the excavations and uncovering the finds here, what did they find? The floor over here, is this is a floor here i'll see if we have some photos here of this floor okay so this is what it looked like here this is part this is what i'd like to show you i want you to notice note the grapes and if you look at the beautiful tessera stones this this is a really beautiful mosaic floor now two of these floors two of the floors here are from 
they're both from churches, one from the Byzantine period, which is 324 to 638 CE. And one of the floors is almost 1,700 years old. And there's an empty rectangle right over here. It's kind of hard to see, but there was inscription that said, have peace on the inhabitants of Shiloh. So first of all, we have our first inscription. It's only 1,700 years old and not 3,500, but for archeologists in Israel, in a site like this, that's definitely enough. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump right up on top. We're not even gonna have to walk all the way up to the top of ancient Shiloh. So here we are at the top of ancient Shiloh. And this over here is our observation tower. We call it Migdal Haro'e, which means to see, and also named for Shmuel Hanavi. So when we're talking about uh, Shiloh, for 369 years, this is Israel's first capital. It's also the place of Hannah's prayer and where Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet, grows up. So what I wanna show you is this beautiful tower. But before I show you the beautiful tower, I wanna to show you the area from a bird's eye view. Remember I told you that when we come to an ancient site, we wanna find proof that this is the actual site. So here we are at the top of the archeological tell. A tell is an artificial mountain with layers and layers and layers of history. Everywhere we dig on this mountain, we're going to find something. But let's open up our Tanakh. Let's open up our Tanakh and the book of Judges. The end of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 19. I'll read in Hebrew and then I'll translate. This is like using ways in ancient times. It tells you exactly how to get to Shiloh. And there was the festival of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh which is north of Beit El, east of the highway that goes from Beit El to Shechem, and on the south of Livona. Now, how do we know how to get to Shiloh? First of all, we know where ancient Beit El is. We know where Livona is. Now, what highway are we talking about here? There's a highway that we have in Israel today, Highway 60, goes from all the way up from Afula down to Beersheba. It's in the exact same location as the highway of the patriarchs, Derech Ha'avot. If you open up the book of Bereshit, you'll follow Avram Avinu walking back and forth, Yaakov Avinu when he has his dream, and Beit El, and he walks, and then Joseph when he looks for his brothers, he walks on this highway, the highway that you see here today. I get my gas literally where Abraham pitched his tent, and Joseph was walking just before his brothers caught him and threw him in the pit. This is where we live and this is where it is. But I have to tell you something, I've lived here for 25 years and I kind of started taking this for granted. I wanna share a story with you. When Miri, who's the head of the regional council was on maternity leave, I was asked to give a tour. First of all, there are lots of, um, during the year when we don't have Corona, we have about 150,000 visitors a year, the majority from abroad. Part, more than 50% of the tourists that come from abroad are Christians who come on pilgrimage, who come because they believe in Hana and Samuel and the Mishkan, and they're so happy to come. So I was giving a tour to Christian tourists, but I was asked by the regional council, they said, look, German television, they're coming to write about the conflict, about the region, and we want them to join your tour and hear a little bit about the Tanakh, a little bit about the history. So they joined the tour, at the end of the tour, they said, look, we didn't get enough footage. Do you mind just holding your Bible again and pointing? So I opened my Bible and I started reading this verse. And I read my Bible in English. I didn't have to read the Hebrew. It says the Holy Scriptures. And I read east of the highway that goes from Bethel to Shechem and I pointed to the highway. They stopped the camera and said, it doesn't say highway in there. I said, yes, it does. Would you like to see? So she grabs my Bible and says, oh my gosh, it says highway. And there's the highway. We're doing this again. I want a close up on your finger on the verse and I want the cameras coming from the back. I was so sorry I didn't have a manicure that day. So, uh, this was a big program on German television. But I'll tell you what I learned from this story. Their shock shocked me into the fact that I take this for granted, that this is the highway we drive on. This is where we get our gas. This is our history. The highway of the patriarchs is exactly where it was for thousands of years. What happened that day with German television is there were tourists from China, there were tourists from South Korea, there were tourists from Germany, there were tourists from all over the world, and they started asking them, aren't you afraid? This is a conflict zone. They said, no, 
we're, we're here drinking coffee, we're here at Chilo. And they changed their program from a conflict to Chilo, the best tourist site in Israel. So that's just a, a great story. And we're gonna go back to the observation tower, Migdal Haroe. And I wanna show you inside, if we were to go inside and when you do come, you're going to watch an incredible movie here. What are we gonna see? And why is this so special? Every tourist site you've been to in Israel before has a movie. And usually the movie, there are actors and actresses that are acting out the scenes in some kind of a studio. But look through these windows. First of all, this technology was used for the first time in the world here. There are 12 windows for the 12 tribes. Each one of the windows has a number of sheets of glass and between each sheet of glass is a plasma. Electricity is off, it's a clear window and electricity is connected, becomes a solid movie screen. Now what we did is the topography hasn't changed here in thousands of years. We know that this is Shiloh. We know that this is where the biblical story occurred. So we brought actors and actresses to the actual site. And when you watch the, um, when you watch the movie through the window, the Mishkan, the tabernacle is superimposed on the actual site, which is here beneath us. I'll just show you a short segment of the video, which is in Hebrew, just so you get the idea of what you see when you come to Shiloh. Okay, so that was just the short trailer. I'm gonna try and close this here. Okay, so here we are. Here we are back in the, um, in the movie theater, which is great on a hot day like this. So when a group comes to Shiloh, this will be one of the stops here to sit inside and to watch the movie. It's, it's amazing. I'll tell you, before we had this movie, there were about 20,000 visitors a year. The last five years we've had the movie, and now we have 150,000 visitors. And we hope after the COVID-19 is over and everyone will have a refuash lema, uh, the tourists will be coming back. We are going to go outside to look at the view. So here we are. This is modern Chilo up here with about 500 families. These are part of the... Um, archaeological finds. Shiloh was established in 1978 um, as an archaeological excavation. That's how the town was established. Now I want to share um, another story. We're still here on top of the mountain. Um, we're standing right by the observation tower and I want you to look down here. Can you see all the flags just beneath us where I have my mouse is going back and forth? If we're looking for the place of the Mishkan, we're going to be looking for something that's 100 cubits by 50 cubits. That's 50 meters by 25 meters. And it's going to go from the direction east to west. This is the west. We believe the Holy of Holies was in the west. And these flags are the flags of the tribes. And the width is exactly 25 meters. Now, right up over here, this is the town of Eli. This is where I live, named for Elia Cohen. And my house is right on top of this mountain. You can probably see it if you really look carefully. So we live overlooking King Mishka. And we lived in a caravan for 10 years on a hilltop. And we decided that part of Eli, one of the hilltops of Eli, and after 10 years, we decided that if we really believe in what we're doing, we're going to build our permanent home here. My sister-in-law is our architect. And she said, after 10 years in a caravan, you probably have a dream to build uh, a big, beautiful home with nice tiles and a big kitchen. So there's one thing that's important to us, that our children grow up understanding and appreciating the privilege they have of living in the biblical heartland. And when we started the infrastructure for our home, we found hundreds of pottery shards. I'll show you two of them right here. Hundreds of ancient pottery shards just outside in our future backyard. At the time I was studying for my master's degree in Land of Israel and Archaeology took the pottery shards to Barilan University, took a pillowcase, stuffed it with all my pottery shards, drove to Barilan, and asked my professor after class to help me date the pieces of pottery. He thought I'd give him one, two, three pieces. At the end of the class, he looks at me and he sees my pillowcase and I pour it on his table. He says, you crazy? This is illegal. I said, but it's not from a site. It's from my backyard. 
I said, where do you live? I said, I live in Eli, named for Eli HaKohen, overlooking the place of the Mishkan, and what's called in Hebrew, Bechol HaRo'eh, as far as the eye can see. Now, I want you to understand, let's go back to Shiloh from above, okay? Now, let's, this is the time of the Mishkan. When the Mishkan was here, for 369 years, this was a small town. This is here we are at the outskirts of Shiloh. Now, can you imagine standing on my hilltop over here? Maybe this hilltop over there. According to Jewish halacha, it's okay if you have to offer the sacrifice in Shiloh. Stand in line, offer your barbecued Kentucky Fried Sacrifice, whatever, right? You stand in line here, you offer your, your korban, your sacrifice. But because it's such a small town, even though it's the capital of Israel, According to Jewish law, you can eat your kochin kalin, you can eat your sacrifice on any of the hilltops. Bechol haroe, as far as the eye can see. But you have to be able to see the Mishkan standing up and sitting down. It says this in the Gemara, in the Talmud, and Megillah, and in Zvachim, there's a whole reference. that You have to sit down and stand up. You can't have anything in between you and the Mishkan. It can't be a tree or a river or anything. And we always tell people that come to our home that this is where they invented the disposable dishes. As soon as they finish eating the holy sacrifice, pottery is porous, absorbs the holiness of the, the kedusha, the holiness of the korban, of the sacrifice, and therefore the dishes have to be broken after their use. So we, we have broken dishes of Jewish families from 3,500 years ago all over our backyard. And every time it rains, we find more pieces of pottery in the earth. My kids are always finding pieces and guests that come are always finding pieces. And we planned our dining room. I asked my sister-in-law to make sure there are windows. When you sit down at the table, you can look down at Chilo. And we kindly asked our guests not to break the dishes after the meal. They can clear them or they can wash them. But that's one of our connections. From this mountain over here, we have another window that points to Ma'ale Levona, which is the first battle of the Maccabees against the Greeks. When I was a, a child in California, I'll just show you what it looks like, the Cholaway, all the mountains surrounding Shiloh, you could offer the sacrifices. I'll just show you over here, Ma'ale Levona, this is the first battle of the Maccabees against the Greeks. And on the first night of Hanukkah, we dress the kids up as Maccabees and Greeks, and, I, and we have this big window pointing to the, to the battlefield of the Maccabees, the first battlefield and the eighth and final battlefield. And I dress them up as Maccabees Greeks and they kill each other and they love it. And we, when I was a child in California, my dream was to celebrate Christmas. And I begged my parents every year. And they said, one day you'll understand why we celebrate Hanukkah. And when we, I realized that right outside our window is the story of Hanukkah, I made sure that that will be part of my children's upbringing and part of their home. So this is my Levona. Let's go back to... I'm going to go back up to the Haro'e Tower. Now, I want to go inside. We have a really nice museum. And what I want to show in the museum over here, this is a copy of the inscription, the original inscription. We didn't have a museum at the time. So it's in the Good Samaritan Museum, which is a mosaic museum on your way down from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. But this looks almost exactly the same. If we look at the second row, it, there's an N and then a C, I, upside down V, which is an L, C, Lo, an O, Y, N, C, Lo, In. Okay, so here we have C, Lo. Why do we have an N? There's, for, in ancient times, you always add an N. If you're from Florida, you're a Floridian, right? That's in modern times. San Francisco, San Franciscan, Shilo, Shilonian. In ancient times, we'd always add an N, Achia, Hashiloni, Achia, the Shilonite. So here we have Shilo. We have the pasuk that I read to you, the reference of how to get to Shiloh, where Shiloh is. And then we have the preservation of the ancient biblical name. There was an Arab village in the 19th century called Sailun. So we have Silo, Silo in, Sailun. So here we have um, all three proofs that this is definitely Shiloh. What else are we looking for? In this museum, you will see that there are these immense jugs. These are called Kalorim jugs. They're for, typical from the time of Joshua. This one over here is a typical one. We found over 70, and two summers ago, we found 15 more, and they're very, very big. They had grape juice. Grape juice, some of them had wheat, some of them had olive oil, 
and they were in a storage room that I like to call the first Costco's in history because they had everything in bulk. It was for the Olay Regal, for the pilgrims that were walking from all over Israel for days, congregating three times a year in Chilo. Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, three times a year. They've been walking for days. And what you feel like drinking after you've been walking for five, six, seven days is grape juice because it has a lot of sugar. It's the ancient Coca-Cola. There's a lot of sugar for you, for your blood to feel better and to get ready to offer your sacrifices. So there are a lot of interesting finds. And I promise you, when you come to Shiloh, I will point every single find out. What I love is that it says here at the museum that you are invited to touch Shiloh's past. Usually it says, please don't touch. And here you can touch the wall. I gave a tour once to a group of blind and we smelt the incense and we touched the pottery. And it was really, really, really a special tour. So we are gonna go outside now, back outside. And I wanna tell you the story of this building and, and start talking a little bit about Hannah and her prayer. So here we are on the top of Shiloh again with a very modern structure. I asked the architect, I said, what were you thinking when you, a lot of people call this the spaceship and like, what were you thinking when you designed this? So this is an archeological tell which is layers and layers and layers of history. And this is 20, you know, the 2000, 20, the 2020, 2018, whenever they built the structure. And he said, this is, what, this is what we use today. I wanted something modern. So one day when they dig the remnants from our period, this is what they'll find. So this is where the story of Hannah, I'm gonna talk about Hannah's prayer a little bit. Um, but at first I wanna tell you the story of the modern Hana, of a modern Hana that came to Shiloh. So the story, the biblical story of Hana, is that she comes and she prays for a son. Uh, the, the Chachamim the, say that for 19 years, Chazal say for 19 years she came to pray and her prayers answered and she gives birth to a boy. She names him Shmuel and later he will become Shmuel Hanavi. He'll grow up in the Mishkan. And there's a woman named Hana from Florida and from Miami, and she told me her story. She came to Shiloh, she came to Israel, she, she had three daughters and really, really wanted a son. And she tried for years and people kind of gave up on her and everyone had different suggestions. And one friend said, you're in Israel, why don't you go to Shiloh? She came to Shiloh, she told me she had the prayer of her lifetime. She also went to Kever Shmuel Hanavi, the tomb of, Nebi, of Shmuel Hanavi, which kind of ruins my story, but that's okay. And she had the prayer of her lifetime. On Rosh Hashanah, she discovers that she's pregnant with a son. Or she's pregnant. And nine months later, she gives birth to a son and names him Shmuel. Shmuel had the most incredible bar mitzvah in Shiloh. Everyone came from Miami. Later on, he enlisted in the IDF. And when it was time to build this building, when they heard we were building the structure, they wanted to give a gift to begin the building so we could go later to the uh, Misrad uh, Tayarut, to the Ministry of Tourism and the JNF, et cetera, et cetera. So a great story, perfect story for the tour guide, but it doesn't end here. Her daughter calls me up a few years ago and says, Eliana, I'd really like you to lead our tour and bring you all my friends from Miami, tell them all your stories, and I have a surprise for you. She gets off the bus with a beautiful baby with earrings and says, Eliana, please meet Eliana. We get to the place of the Mishkan, I'll tell you the story. So we walk up the hill and then we start walking down the place of the Mishkan. And I see there's another baby in a stroller about the same size. She picks up her twins and she bursts into tears. So I want you to share my story with your groups. She said, it was my dream to have a huge family and I couldn't get pregnant. And I prayed for twins, for a boy and a girl. And these are my twins. Eliana means Eli Anna, my God answered. Hashem answered my prayers. Ma, she said, mom, she's my Shmuel. And we came here and we said a prayer of thanksgiving, a tefillat hodeya, just like Hannah who comes back to the Mishkan with Shmuel and Avi and prays a prayer of thanksgiving. And it was one of the most beautiful tours ever. But I wanna share something with you. In Israel today, you have to be very careful when you talk about religion. Nobody wants you to tell them to pray. And I used to be very, very good at giving a perfect tour, archeology, span history, and not even talking about Hana. But ever since I started sharing the story, I keep hearing stories of different people and their different miracles. So I'm gonna, we're gonna walk down to the Mishkan now. I like to stop here on my way down to the Mishkan and talk a little bit about prayer. We're gonna go to the place of the Mishkan. 
And before we talk about prayer, I'm just going to show you. Hold on one second. Okay. So when you come to Shiloh today, you don't see anything at the place of the Mishkan, but at the entrance, you can go into the hologram and you can really learn about the tabernacle, about the Mishkan, about the Korbanot. So this is what it looks like on the inside, if the Mishkan were standing here today. Uh, this is the Mizbeach, and this is the Kior, the, the, where the, the uh, Kohanim would wash their hands and feet. Let's go inside. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay. All right, we're going back up to the top. So where exactly did Hana stand? Every time I bring a group here to Shiloh, I'm asked, so where did she stand? Did she stand over here? Did she stand over there? So you can see this is the Mishkan that's superimposed on the site that we have here today. I want to show you what it looks like. Let's go back to today. Hold on one second. Okay, so we're going to stop here for a second at the place of the Mishkan. I want to tell you some stories about Hana and her prayer. Um, they say that she moved her lips and no sound came out. Eli had never seen anyone praying, so he thought she was drunk. And the, and the question was, was she drunk? I say she was drunk, not from, from wine, but from prayer. This was a very intense prayer. This was a very, a very different prayer. She wasn't praying for herself. She was praying for her people. They say that for 19 years, Hana prayed for a son. She prayed for a child. And for 19 years, her prayer wasn't answered. So why is this prayer so different? Let me just get to the prayer for a moment. So she's praying. She's moving her lips. And Ailee doesn't know what she's doing. And her prayer is very, very, very intense. And the reason it's so intense in this prayer that we remember it is because she's not praying for herself. She's praying for her nation. At the end of the book of Judges, just before the story of Hannah begins in the book of Shmuel, it says, By Amim hahem en melech Yisrael, In those days, there's no king in Israel. Ish hayashar be'enav yaseh. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. People have forgotten the Mishkan. People have forgotten to come to Shiloh. And Elkanah, Hannah's husband, with his two wives, they go from town to town and they camp out. And people say, where are you going? They say, we're going to the Mishkan. We're going to Shiloh. Come with us. And, and that's what they do. And when Hannah's praying, she's not praying for herself. She's praying for Shmuel Hanabi, who will be a savior to the people of Israel who will later anoint King David and will build Jerusalem. I'll share another story with you. I was here with a, a, a group, a family, Christian family that had come from the United States. And we get to the place of the Mishkan and there are chairs here. You can sit down. I say, you know, at the end of the tour, I let people do whatever they want, if they want to pray, whatever. But I shared the stories that I shared with you about Hana from Miami and, and, and her story and Eliana. When I shared the story, the entire family burst into tears. I didn't know what was happening. The tour guide that was with them said, look, Eliana, you didn't know this, but Paul, the father, is very, very sick. Uh, he was told by his doctors that he only has two months to live. And this is his last trip to Israel. He wanted to come to Israel one last time. And of course, they're very, very, and I gave them this whole list of miracles and all these stories. I felt horrible. I said, Paul, I, I don't know what to say. And he says, whatever God has planned for me, I fully accept. I said, well, Paul, I'm Jewish. And we believe that even if you have a sword to your throat, we pray for a miracle. And I'm going to pray for you for a Rifu Ashlema. And um, at the end, we parted and I didn't stay in touch with them. But a year and a half later, I was giving a tour in Shiloh. And one of the guides comes running all the way from this side of Shiloh to the entrance to Shiloh and says, Eliana, everybody's looking for you. There's a family here from America. They're standing by the hologram at the entrance. The father's name is Paul. They don't know if you remember them. I, I don't know very many Pauls. I had a feeling it's the same family. I told my group, stay here. I'm coming back with an amazing story. Everybody came running after me. We all ran to the hologram and there was Paul alive, not fully well. He was in a wheelchair, but still well enough to make it all the way from the United States. And he looks at me and he says, you prayed for a miracle. 
Now, the moral of the story is not come to Shiloh, touch the stones, and you'll be cured. It's really understanding that Hannah's prayer is about humility. It's about being humble. It's about knowing that God's not an ATM machine and we can ask, but we don't know what the outcome will be. And people that come to Shiloh, and it, said, it says that Hannah was bitter. It says, And she's praying from the bottom of her heart. And she's bitter and she's angry and she's, she's begging God. And when you, when you reach bottom, rock bottom, that, that's, that's a good time to pray because you know that nothing's in your control. And that's the story of Shiloh. That's the story of Hannah's prayer. And that's also the story of, of what we're going through today with the corona. Um, I think that the coronavirus has really taught us we thought we had control, some kind of control of our lives. And I used to go walking out here in Chilo, and now I'm sitting here in my bedroom on Zoom with all of you. And we, I can't see you and you can't come here. And I think that um, this virus has really taught us humility. We're learning, we learned from how to pray from Hana and Shilo. We learn how to pray from Hana and Shilo. This is where we learn the halachot of tefillat amida, of the silent prayer, where you move your lips, you put your feet together, and you pray silently. We learn how to pray from Hana and Shiloh. And today, all over the world, we're not allowed to go back into our synagogues. We're praying outside. We're praying in minions on porches. We're praying in the street. We pray in our backyard and on the sidewalk and in the street. And we're learning new halachot, new halachas. Who's allowed to come? How many people? Where are the women supposed to sit? Everything's, everything's new, everything's different. Um, but today we're all praying for each other. And I'd like to share two more stories and then we're gonna have some time for questions. So I'll tell you another interesting story about prayer and its connection to social media. Um, I run the Instagram for Ancient Chilo. I believe that a picture is worth a thousand words. I have almost 17,000 followers. And every time people come on my tours, I ask them to follow ancient underscore Shiloh and they know that we can be in touch. And I get messages from people from all over the world. We were with you in Shiloh and this, this one is pregnant and this one's getting married. And I get photos of babies all the time of people that came on tours and prayed in Shiloh. And it's amazing. One time I gave a tour, um, also, when Mary was on maternity leave, I had this group of uh, journalists from South America, the largest news outlets. They came for a geopolitical tour. It was all about politics. They were asking uh, very, very serious questions. And when they got off the bus, all the men were wearing kafias to show me exactly what their political views are. And we started the day with an outlook, with an outlook overlooking the green line and driving through the area and talking about the, the conflict. When we got to Shiloh, I said, Shiloh is an oasis of peace in an area that some people uh, consider a conflict zone. I consider the biblical heartland. And I was thinking, you know, I don't wanna spoil Shiloh with politics. So I said, these people are from South America. Their mother sent them to Sunday school. They know who Shmuel, Samuel, Kana, they've heard these names before. I'm gonna give them the tour with all of my love and passion as if they're Christian tours. So we got to the end of the tour and we're standing here at the place of the Mishkan. I said, yeah, I was officially from the regional council. I didn't wanna tell them to pray, but I said, I'm going back to the bus. If anybody would like to pray, please, you have a few minutes. So I turn around, they're all praying. So I decided to pray. And one of the men, the guy who gave me the most difficult time that day, he comes up to me and he says, can you pray for me? I said, sure, what would you like me to pray for? He says, I have a medical issue. And I said, so I'll do what we do in, you know, what, what the Jews do in synagogue. I said, what's your name? He said, Rafaelo. What's your mother's name? Maria. So I said, Rafaelo ben Maria. And he bursts into tears and he's sobbing on my shoulder. I look up and I see all the journalists standing in line waiting for me to give them a blessing. From that day, they call me Baba Eliana in, in uh, Shiloh because I give blessings. But I'll tell you the, the connection between Hannah's prayer and Instagram, and then we'll conclude and have time for questions. That day I got home, I had asked them to follow the Instagram account of Shiloh, and I looked to see who followed the account. I followed them back. And I see that these, these huge, these are the huge news outlets in South, all over South America with a million followers and half a million followers and two million. And oh my gosh, what did they post that day on their Instagram accounts? 
from the morning we were looking at the green light, I don't know where they found barbed wire, but black and white photos of barbed wire. And they wrote occupation, um, Cijordania, which is West Bank in Spanish, and nothing positive. The same Instagram accounts on the same day, same people, beautiful photos from Shiloh, Shiloh at sunset, because we had been there for hours, I was blessing all of them. And what did they write? Shiloh, the place where man meets God. Shiloh, the place where dreams come true. Shiloh, a must on your next trip to Israel. And that's when I learned two things, that when you want to show the positive and the beauty, it's possible. It's possible to, to agree on certain things. It's possible to show only the good things and not the conflicts. And it's going to be two Ba'ab, the 15th of Av, next this week, Wednesday night. It's considered the Israeli or the Jewish Valentine's Day. I want to show you, um, let's see if we have the, the pictures here again. Uh, no more pictures. Okay, well, remember when I showed you the movie, there were the women dancing in the vineyards. Let's see if I can show it to you again. Okay, here we go. So what's the story of Tu Be'av? The story of Tu Be'av, it's not a romantic story like people think. People think that it's a romantic story. People think it's a story about love between men and women, but it's really a story about unity. It's a story about unity because the 12 tribes, there was a horrible, horrible war between the 12 tribes, the 11 tribes and the tribe of Benjamin. And it was decided that the women could not marry, that we could not marry the tribe of Benjamin until they were only left with 600 men. Now let's look around this region. And I want you to really, you're going to really understand the story of Tuba. Now this over here, when I'm going to go back to, sorry, I don't want to make you dizzy over here. Okay, these are vineyards. These are all vineyards. It's kind of hard to see because this, this was taken in the winter. And let's go back to the top. I just want to show you what it looks like today and see if we can have a look at the valley. Okay, can you see this valley in the background? That is the valley that the Arabs like to call. Can everybody see this in the back? It's a big valley. It's called Sahel El Banat, the valley of the girls or Sahel al Eid. The Arabs preserve this ancient biblical name of the Valley of the Festival or the Valley of the Girls. Now, what happened here? Thousands of years ago, there was the festival of Hashem from year to year in Shiloh. It was the festival of Tu Ba'av. What happened on Tu Ba'av on the 15th of the Hebrew month of Av, which is always in August? There's a field, an empty field. Surrounding the fields are, great, are vineyards. The men would hide in the vineyards. The women would be dancing in the empty field because it's empty in August, and during Pesach, during Passover or Shavuot, it's, it's field of wheat. But in the summer, there's nothing in the field, so it's a perfect dance floor. What does the moon look like on the 15th of Av? It's a full moon. So we have the spotlight on the dance floor. The women dancing in their borrowed white gowns. Why were they borrowed? So you couldn't tell who was rich and who was poor. And the men would be hiding in the vineyards, and everyone would grab a wife. Now, why would they do something crazy like that? Because we swore never to remarry into the tribe of Benjamin. And when you grab yourself a wife, even though they say it was a prearranged marriage, they, they weren't breaking the vow. And so this is a beautiful festival of love and of unity. And it's bringing the children of Israel back together. And we celebrate that this week. They say, Lo ayu yamim tovim l'Israel ba'av. There were, the best days were the 15th of Av and Yom Kippurim, because this reminds us of Yom Kippur, wearing white and forgiving each other. This is a holiday of forgiveness. This is a holiday of unity. And my conclusion of this tour is, I'm, I'm standing here in Eli overlooking Shiloh. And you are all over the United States. And we can't see each other today. I can't come to you and you can't come to me. And I hope that this, I, I pray, and I pray from, from the place of the prayer of Chana that there will be refuash lema for all of Am Yisrael and that we will be able to meet soon. But there's a story in the book of Judges 
about Micha, who was right across the street, I mean, literally across the street in ancient times. So here we are at Chilo. And on this mountain over there is the story of Pesel Micha, the story of Micha, who was idol worshiping. And they say the smoke from his idol worshiping and the smoke from Shiloh, which is right over here, mixed together. And so the, the commentaries say, how is that? They, you know, what they, they should have killed him. And why do they give him that special schut, that special privilege? They, because he had an Airbnb. He opened his home to guests. And that's a mitzvah, and that's chesed. And we learn that doing mitzvahs, doing good deeds, is something that brings people together even if you're also doing not such great deeds like idol worshiping. And I think that the incense from all the way from America and here in Israel, we meet together. And in the meantime, you can't come here, but we can pray for you. I'll be very, very happy. First, I'm going to take your questions. But if any of you would like to send me an email with the names of people you'd like me to pray for, every day I go right outside to my backyard, looking down at the place of the Mishkan, and I pray for refuah shlema for people. I pray for people to get married. And you can send to Passantine, P-A-S-S-E-N-T-I-N-18 at gmail.com. Uh, or you can send it to me on Instagram. I'm happy to pray for you at the place of the Mishkan or here. And I pray that we will meet soon physically, personally, here in Shiloh, and that you'll come on a real tour and not just this virtual tour. I hope you, did, you enjoyed this and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Eliana. This was really wonderful. Uh, you probably didn't see all the comments while you were speaking, uh, but they were incredibly positive. And I can tell you that we had over 170 people here in the, and we had wow. zero people that left. So that says a lot about how interesting uh, this That's was. Uh, I'd love to start uh, feeding in questions. If people have yep. questions that they want to add to the chat, then now is also a good time. I already That's collected right. some of them. Uh, one yeah. thing that I, I'd like to start with, though, is if you can speak a little bit about Shiloh in a con contextual uh, way. I'll put a map that I got from Miri uh, up, and maybe you can uh, let us know a little bit where Shiloh is located when it comes to uh, the rest of the Binyamin region. And okay, also so Israel. this is the Binyamin region. And, um, okay, let me see I don't know where we are. This is Highway 60, no, it's Highway 90. Okay, so this is the Jordan Valley. Let me see where, okay, can everyone see at the bottom Jerusalem? Can you see Jerusalem at the bottom? Jerusalem is here. Okay. So if you drive north from Jerusalem, you will get to Shiloh, which is right over here, Shiloh and Eli. Now, if you come from Tel Aviv to Rosha Ein and to Ariel, you can also drive to Shiloh. So Shiloh is in 45 minutes from Jerusalem and about an hour from Tel Aviv. It takes my husband 45 minutes to Tel Aviv, but he drives really fast. So if there's no traffic, it's in between 45 minutes to an hour from both Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Um, and so technically, like, we're right in the heartland uh, of Israel. So that's where Shiloh is located. Um, it's kind of hard for me to see, but this is, yeah, there's Ma'ale Levona. Shiloh is right over here. Now, just so you can see on the map, um, there's a lot to do in the region. Um, when people come to Shiloh, they will go on a wine tour. There are a lot of boutique wineries in the immediate area. The Shiloh Winery, Gva'ot Winery, Tura Winery, Sagot Winery, these are all uh, wineries that win gold medals all over the world. The terroir here is perfect for, for winemaking. The high elevation, the hot days, the cold nights, um, and also the bracha that, of Yaakov to uh, Yosef. This is the tribal inheritance of Ephraim, of Yosef. Next question, if you'd like to. Yeah, sure. Uh, this, this was just in order for everyone to see, and I also want to say that I put a, a link to this map uh, on in the chat, just so that everyone knows uh, where to find it also. Uh, Paula Breeze asked, why jugs have pointed bottoms? Do you know what the answer okay. is? Okay, yeah. Okay, so the pointed bottoms, uh, excellent observance on this, on the, cra on the crazy tour. The, the pointed bottoms, it also has to do with the strength um, of the, it's a huge, huge, huge jug, and they would stick them in like a, um, they, they, so they wouldn't move at all. So they'd stick them in place with a pointed bottom. 
they, they kind of dug them like right into the ground. And it also, because of the heat, it's really, really hot here and it, and it holds, it helps with the temperature. Great. So that's uh, the shape and... Question from Laura Green. Uh, why would the Mishkan face west instead of south? Uh, Excellent. I think because south is Jerusalem, right? Right, excellent question. If you recall, I said this is Israel's first capital before Jerusalem. So first of all, Hana is the first person to pray. We didn't have prayer or a direction of prayer, and we did not have Jerusalem yet. Shiloh means shalva umenucha, tranquility and resting. Yerushalayim is the nachala, is the inheritance. And, and Shiloh, it was a building, it was a structure made of stone on the bottom, but fabric on the top. We left the top open because at one point we're going to be moving towards Jerusalem. But still, why to the west? Not the south, but why not the east? Everything was in the east because the, the, the Gentiles would bow down to the sun, to the Mizrah, where the sun was, was rising. And we had our back to that and our face to the west, as it says in the Talmud. Later on, for example, today, I face south when I pray in the morning to Jerusalem. Right. Great. Last question. Uh, Robert uh, Sklaroff asks, did anyone excavate under the highway uh, before it was paved? Yes, that's a really great question. You cannot move in Israel without excavating. And the, the ancient road, so you can't really, f not, let, let's start with, from the top of Highway 60 to the bottom of Highway 60, not every single part of the highway is exactly on the ancient road. Some of it is parallel and there aren't really remnants. There, in Gush Etzion, for example, there are remnants from that ancient road. It's called Derech Ha'avot. You can go there on a tour. So we notice that, that it's in the same location because of the topography, because it's a valley and it's, it's in between the high mountains. But nothing in Israel covers up anything ancient. For example, that huge monstrous building that we have in the middle of an archeological site. The, the top of the site is limestone and it's bedrock. And so it was built like on top of the bedrock, but we had an excavation surrounding it. And we found a mikvah from the second temple period. We found coins that said for the freedom of Zion. So we always dig before we do any kind of building. For example, when I found the pottery shards in my backyard, I got so excited. I brought archeologists to my house thinking, I don't even care if I don't have a house, let's find something. Um, people like to kind of cover that up because they don't want to get, they don't want to cancel their building plans, but nothing's built here uh, over remnants or important remnants. So thanks again, Eliana. This was really amazing. I just want to end by saying that this was part of our also our sovereignty uh, campaign because Shiloh is located in the Binyamin region, which is one of the region which is being discussed when we're always talking about sovereignty and applying sovereignty. And so it's really nice to see the extent of Jewish history uh, that there is in this place. And that's also part of the message that uh, uh, we can take with us uh, from, from this uh, webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, I just wanna- I was Sorry. Someone asked about the Instagram account. It's ancient underscore Shiloh. That's my Instagram account for Shiloh. You can also contact me on Facebook, Eliana Passantin. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And, and also a question um, that the Egged bus maybe stopped there years ago in between Emek Israel to Jerusalem. That would be before 1987, before the, um, before the first intifada when uh, Nablus Shem was open to Israeli tourists and the bus probably stopped there on the way to Jerusalem. Eliana, your email again, please. You were wondering. Passantin, P-A-S-S-E-N-T-I-N 18 at gmail.com. And I will be more than happy to pray for anything for anyone. They say, If you pray for someone else, that prayer will be answered first because God, this Hannah's prayer is all about a selfless prayer. I told this to, um, I gave a tour to Deshaun Watson, you know, the quarterback from the Houston Texans. He came on a special tour of Shiloh and he's, he's a believer and he was so happy to pray in Shiloh, but they started joking about winning the Super Bowl. And if I pray for them, whatever, they'll send me free tickets. I said, look, you guys, you have to pray 
a humble prayer. No, if you understand that you're nothing, that God gave you your gifts, and then, you know, that, that's when your prayer is answered. And to pray for someone else, to start by praying for someone else. So I will be happy to pray for any of you, and I'll be happy to meet you when you, when you can finally come to Israel. And this was a real pleasure, and I'm, I'm so happy this all worked out. Thank you so much again, Mariana. So uh, just to go back to what we said in the beginning, these webinars are something that we've been doing since the beginning of uh, uh, the COVID crisis, and they've been very successful. We've been having some incredible content. This week, we have two more webinars. Uh, one will be on Tuesday, August 4th at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll put the links to sign up uh, in the group chat. Uh, it will be, uh, again, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it will feature uh, Elan Carr, the U.S. Department Special Envoy for Monitoring and Combating Anti-Semitism, and Morten Klein, uh, the ZOA National President, and it will be on the topic of anti-Israel and anti-Zionism. Are these the accepted forms of It will be moderated by Steve Feldman, the Greater Philadelphia ZOA Executive Director. And then on Wednesday, we'll have another meeting of Eastern Time. Uh, it will be with Ambassador Danny Danon that will present, present his book, Israel, The Will to Prevail. Uh, if you enjoyed this uh, webinar and if you support the work that ZOA is doing, then we would really appreciate your help. Uh, ZOA is dependent on your donations. And as you know, this is a time where we're especially dependent uh, on uh, your donations. So we'd be very happy. Uh, we'll put a link also uh, in the chat where you can donate, but you can also just go at zoa.org. Uh, that's our website, and that would be very helpful. So thanks a lot again, uh, and uh, we hope to see you in the next events that we have.